نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونتوب إليه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون عباد الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله أوصيكم وإياي بتقوى الله واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنطلكم منها الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام الحمد لله على نعمة الإيمان الحمد لله على نعمة الإحسان الحمد لله على نعمه كلها ظاهرها وباطنها الحمد لله على نعمة حبيبنا وسيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today I wanted to connect two things that might be seen to be separate and distinct but there is a continuity in terms of the causalities that got us into the place we are in. Many of us are watching the news and the development with our Muslim brothers and sisters in Myanmar. And the systematic and organized genocide that is taking place. There's no other way uh, than to describe it as being a systematic, organized act of genocide that our brothers and sisters are being subject to. And there is an effort to uh, rid the uh, state of approximately 2.5 to 3 percent of the population. If you think about uh, Burma as a state, approximately 3% of the population is Muslim, about 89% are Buddhist, and then the remaining percentage, 7 or 7.5% 7 are Christian population. Now the Muslim population in uh, Burma has a long-standing history, uh, actually as early as possibly the 13th century, uh, Muslims were coming in there as both merchants and uh, ulama, and throughout the history, Muslims have aligned themselves in there as well as the Buddhists aligned themselves with various periods and various Muslim ruling uh, dynasties, whether in the Indian subcontinent or other locations as well. So we have, again, in here, the history of the Muslim community in there is long-standing. But also, the Muslims in Burma are divided into four separate different groupings. One of the groupings is the group that the British brought into uh, Burma during the colonial period. The British uh, again took over Burma around 1826, 1827 and they brought with them from India uh, what they call colonial administrators. And so the British were elite, they managed the colony and brought in various population to do the management. In a similar way that South Africa, you go to South Africa, there is the blacks, then there is the category of colored, and then there were the uh, British and the Dutch who constituted the colonial elite. Uh, that's why if you think about Gandhi, his early history was actually in South Africa as a colonial administrator. <coughs> Similarly, we see in Kenya, Likewise, that the British brought in uh, from various colonies, moving one group of subjects to another area to administer their colonies. 
So the British actually brought in around the 1827 that group of Muslims uh, to be part of the administration as well as some Hindus and others to administer the bureaucracy. Now for us Muslims in America we actually not to say we uh, see some lines but some of the early arrivals of Muslims into the US and Canada actually were coming from South Africa and parts of Africa because as soon as they came into those areas it was easy to jump into the new world and especially we find this to be the case in Canada, especially for some of the early Muslims, some of the early Hindu Sikhs, and then migrating southward. So you could see the global networks that existed in there. Other groups of Muslims in there are actually of Chinese background. And these were historically merchants, because China was connected to the global trade before Trump came into existence, right? The Silk Trade Route is the longest standing transnational trade network in the globe. Right? It's almost 3,000 years in the making. You could actually trade, that's why it's called the Silk, because Silk was something that the Chinese perfected its uh, production and shipped to all parts of the world. And we could understand this because Historically, uh, why do people right now when they, pay, when they buy a tie, it's always silk tie is the highest because that, that was a form of dignitary and honor is that you actually give gifts of silk. And we could see this throughout the tr silk trade route that was part of the tradition. And what is remain of it is this silk tie right now that is seen to be the refinement of face. We'll talk about the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ prohibiting men from wearing silk ties, set that aside, but just to understand that that network was there present throughout history. So we see Muslim merchants from China that were trading in Burma and setting up communities, and we also see it in other parts. And their connection to the Muslim world was also present from the earliest period. Right. For example, for those who visited Yemen, Yemen was the hub of sea trade routes, and therefore if you go all over the coast in Asia, you find some Yemeni communities that are based on that lineage of merchants and traders that rode the, the seas in order to trade. So if you go to Malaysia, you'll find communities from Yemen. You go to China, actually, in the coastal area, it was as far as the 4th century of the Common Era, almost 200 years before the arrival of Islam, there were a port city in China inhabited by Yemeni <coughs> merchants who were engaged in trade. If you go to the coast of India, especially in the south, something that I went there last year, you will see some of those lineages. And therefore, wherever Islam came by sea, it actually implanted the Shafi'i school. Because the Yemenis were the one that took the Shafi'i school. And similarly also on the coast of East Africa, wherever the merchant by sea, wherever Islam came by sea, it came with the Shafi'i tradition. Wherever it went by land, it carried the Hanafi tradition because the route ended up in Baghdad or around Iran or present-day Iraq and then out to parts of Europe or going down south. So we could see in this presence of the Chinese Muslims in Burma that link to this part of the world. A third group of Muslims in, also in Burma are converts, those who converted to, from Buddhism to Islam. Right? And again, this, this linkage of conversion is long-standing. Now, why, do people, why did people in the olden days convert to Islam? There are a variety of reasons, but one part that we could actually point to is people tended to want to imitate those whom they assumed to be powerful and ascending. And again, if you look at the world from the 7th century all the way up to possibly the beginning of the 17th century, people wanted to imitate Muslims. People wanted to get married to Muslims. People wanted to trade with Muslims. 
not to compare, just like today, most of our kids want to imitate the dominant culture in them. So they have their hats backward, they have their pants to their knees, right? Why? Because they assume that is the cultural ascension that we are living in. So you could see some of those dynamics in relations to the Muslim presence and the conversion that took place. And we could see that marriage relations were prominent, and we could study both in Africa as well as uh, in Asia, that was the prominent feature of conversion to Islam. Elites converted to Islam, and people followed the religion of their elites. That people followed the religion of their kings, or their affluent ones, or their elites. And that took place, again, in most of Africa and Asia. It wasn't by means of military. And often you find Orientalist writing that says that Islam was spread by the sword. And they confuse the massive expansion in the first 70 to 80 years with conversion to Islam. And that's why if you read the book of Khaled Blankmanship, right, the Jihad State, which was the first 92 years of the Umayyad dynasty, you could say that there was an expansion, military expansion. But military expansion is different than conversion. Because conversion in many places took about 150 to 200 years. The earliest place for conversion to take place is the area of what we call Iran, Afghanistan, and Iraq. Those were the earliest, about 150 to 200 years conversion. In Spain, Muslims arrived in 711, and literally even staying there for 800 years never reached a majority. They always were an elite minority, right? Some were close to 50%, but not really crossing it governing over predominantly uh, Christian and Jewish population. So military conquest did not mean conversion to Islam. It took a longer period of time. Orientalists take the military conquest and immediately say that Islam was spread by the sword. It was not the case. And we have in this country a clear evidence of this. One of the fastest growing rate of conversion in America is African Americans. And the place of conversion is actually in prison. And definitely me and you don't see so many Muslims running in prison with swords, converting people. Actually, under their own roof, there's an evidence against that major claim. Against what they assume to be this case. Now, why we're having this major crisis in Burma is there is a military rule in Burma that classified Muslims as foreigners. Classified Muslims, again, they've been there for the, from at least the earliest from 1400, if not before, or the common era, not 1400 today, we're talking about the Islamic calendar. They've been classified under the new regulations, beginning at least the, this, some 19, 1974 onward, is to classify Muslims as foreigners. Now, this gets me to the connection to the period of Muslims in Spain, which I brought it in earlier. Now, what Muslims were expelled in 1492 by classifying them to be something other than being Spanish, and therefore beginning to see them as not European, or not Christians and not Jewish. So, again, the, the same structure of removing from the group, externalizing it, was something that was carried out in 1492. And in here you have a population that existed in Spain for 800 years, meaning these were Spanish that were actually born generation after generation, and ended up again in completely ethnically cleansing Muslims from Spain. That today we're speaking about the ethnic cleansing that took place. More importantly, there were also people who converted to Christianity, forced to convert to Christianity. They were also expelled in 1609. 650,000 were expelled that existed or lived now mostly in North Africa. And we met some of their descendants just recently in Spain, in Granada. Now what is the reason for, again, we could discuss the reasons for the uh, expansion of Spain and so on, but definitely the fragmentation, the lack of cohesion, the lack of unity, the inner fighting, the lack of a purpose for the Muslims made it possible for the calamities to take place that we're still facing. 
Like every week, you read the news, you think that we stopped digging, and you find there's a lot of people that are still digging. Right? So we have we are at the lowest rung of our history, the lowest rung of what we are attempting to see. In essence, uh, it has become a normal. Like we don't even feel the news uh, in terms of what is taking place toward. Muslims both in parts of the Muslim world, but also you could see some of our circumstances in this country as well. So the, the crisis is real. The crisis is real. And what it requires for us is to ask the question how to change it. Because I could sit in here and begin to cry, with it. I could cry from you again, from the collapse of Baghdad in 1258, we could take you to the collapse of Spain, I could detail you the history, go through the Inquisition, go down to uh, the 20th century, and we could enumerate, and not mention in Iraq, just in print us. What is, what is it to be done? What is it that we need to be done? And I think one of the fundamental issues that we need to do is how for us to develop a unity toward the common good among ourselves. Part of the issue is that we have left aside the collective good as a purpose, as a, as a way for us to work collectively. Not to use the uh, shoe rack as an example, but I usually use that as an example. Everybody wants to put their shoes, and they're concerned about their shoes, but nobody is concerned about everybody else's shoes. The moment that you begin to think of everybody's shoes, ahead of your shoes is a moment of a change. The public good, the collective good, is more important and more critical than the self-good in general. So the concept of what is public interest for Muslims? What is the public interest for Muslims? Is it Allahumma nafsi, O oh Allah, O oh myself? That's for the hereafter. But to get to the Holy Rapture, you have to sacrifice for the other. You have to sacrifice for the other. We have a concept of ithar. Trying to think of the other ahead of yourself. To try to think of the other ahead of yourself. So how we develop this as part of a public policy for us? Right? How to develop that as a part of a public policy? How to teach it? How to inoculate ourselves with this particular paradigm in order for us to actually qualitatively make a difference. The Prophet said, Yadullahi ma'al jama'ah. But if you have a jama'ah that are punching each other, there is no Yadullahi ma'al in there. We often think of ourselves in a boxing match and we confuse theology with public policy. So we only encounter each other in debates of theological. So we think of the other that unless they agree with me theologically, and legally on every point, I'm not going to do anything with them relative to the shoe rack. So both of us get the shoes thrown on us while we're entertaining ourselves with the minute theological and legal debates. Right? So how to create this as a major way for us? Look at this room. We might end up the day with almost 500 or 1,000 people. What is our common collective public policy in general for ourselves and how we transform it into an applicable strategy to change it. In corporate world, you call it corporate culture, right? And the corporate culture goes, everybody has to adhere to the corporate culture. So what is the divine culture for us in the public space as Muslims? We say in Arabic, if you don't respect yourself, nobody else respects you. Are we at a point where we respect each other, respect the dignity that each one of us wants as really a representative of God in this world? And if we don't have that respect, then we cannot ask the others to respect us, one. And then we can't really complain about the multiplicities of issues that are facing. For me, that has been one of the most driving points that we need to change. Is to utter and to manifest our collective public interest as a community and look for the interest of the other ahead of yourself. Which is again at the foundation. We have a hadith of the Prophet none of you truly believe until he loves for his brother what he, lives for, what he loves for himself. 
or herself. So when you apply it into a policy, a public policy, a public engagement, then that will make a qualitative change in our conditions in here, as well as, inshallah, will manifest it across the world. أقول قمي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم واستغفر الله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونتوب إليه وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله ولو كره المشركون now, how to get to the next step is an important piece. Many of us are often thinking that we are waiting for Umar ibn al-Khattab type of personality. We're waiting for Ali radiallahu an. I for Palestinians, we're still talking about if Salah al-Din was here. And we enumerate, this is what you call the hero syndrome. The hero syndrome. It's just we're waiting for someone. If you're waiting for someone, what is the what is the response? Is you're sitting and sipping your chai latte, right? I'm waiting at Starbucks because they have Wi-Fi, and when uh, Salah al-Din or Omar al-Din comes, I'll get a Twitter, what you call alert, and then mashallah, things will happen. <laughs> but let me tell you, the person you're waiting for is sitting in here. You, the person you're waiting for is here. Is you. And you need to take yourself seriously in order for you to begin to make the change that you would like to see. Doesn't mean that you're gonna, again, think that I'm just gonna muscle everyone else. Is that you have to think that you are capable as a person to take matters of significance and act upon it. The Prophet and each one of you is an overseer and everyone is responsible for that which they have to oversee. Including all the way to the servant that is engaging in, ser in service for the house that they're responsible for the wealth that is under them. Now you know this, you know again in your work, you're responsible, you don't what you call, if you leave it to somebody else, your annual evaluation will show where so and so, well he didn't do his work, he didn't do this, he didn't do this, he didn't do this, and then really we have to part company with you. So in matters of world, we know what is responsibility. But in matter of higher magnitude, which is relationship with Allah and relationship with the humanity, because each one of you, for me, is a representative of God on this earth. Right? Allah did not only appoint the Prophet ﷺ as Khalifa Allah in the earth. He did. But He also appointed Inni Ja'ilun fil Ardi Khalifa. All the Ni Adam fulfilled that role in their capacities. So how we begin to actually shift from one level of hero worship and thinking that somebody's gonna come and knock on the door while you're again sipping your chai latte or consuming from the world without thinking of what needs to be undertaken. So how to make each one of you actually fulfilling that role. Each one of us is responsible. Each one of us is responsible with their own circle of influence. Each one of us is connected to someone else. You're connected to your own house, how many children you have, the wife you have, your nessa, your lineage, all the people around you. If you think, you say, oh, I can't do much. You can. Most everyone in here is responsible for a circle between 100 to 200 individuals. Right? At minimum, you, are, you have a circle of 200 individuals. What is your khilafah in that? I'll tell you what khilafah. We take the khilafah and we say haram, 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 right? And basically we transform all of our engagements condemnation of the other. This is again, is taking the minute and making it into a public policy. And often we try to force people in things that we ourselves are not adhering to. Right? So how to transform ourselves in a reality to be people that actually <laughs> aspire to transform not only ourselves but also the community that is around us. <laughs> and don't think that we're safe in here or any other place. Muslims in Spain for 800 years they thought that they were safe. 
Your safety is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and safety in terms of what you make as an impact at the moment that you are present and the moment that you are able to contribute. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and protect our brothers in, uh, in Burma to help them in this calamity that they are facing. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us that we don't face the same calamity because the calamity that they are facing is not because of their lack of belief and the calamity is not before us, is not because of our magnitude of belief. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are living in the world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, but we ask Allah to continue to protect us, to continue to make it possible for us to actually get up every day and do our prayers without anybody interfering in our affairs. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to see truth as a truth and act upon it, make it, make it possible for us to enjoy our hearts so we will be actually united both in prayers as well as in action in this world because of the calamities that are befalling us. I say this and I pray for you and I pray for you. Inna Allah and Allah are not the same on the Nabi. Ya ayah the one who is 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 the one. كما صليت على سيدنا إبراهيم وعلى آل سيدنا إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إني داع فأمين اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا فيك أعطيت وقنا واصرف عنا بالخير شر ما قضيت فإنك تقضي بالخير ولا يضع عليك وإنه لا يذل من وليت تبارك ربنا وتعاليك ربنا ردنا إلى الإسلام ردا جميلا ربنا ردنا إلى الإسلام ردا جميلا ربنا ردنا إلى الإسلام ردا جميلا اللهم أصلح ذات بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم أصلح ذات بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم أصلح ذات بيننا يا رب العالمين اللهم ألف قلوبنا يا رب العالمين اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا يا رب العالمين اللهم ألف بين قلوبنا يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وزقنا اتباعا وأرنا الباطل باطلا وزقنا اجتنابا اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأمات يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأمات يا رب العالمين اللهم ارحم المسلمين والمسلمات الأحياء منهم والأمات يا رب العالمين اللهم خفف عن المسلمين عامة يا رب العالمين اللهم خفف عن مرضى المسلمين جميعا يا رب العالمين اللهم خفف عن مرضى المسلمين يا رب العالمين اللهم أمنا في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم أمنا في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم أمنا في كل مكان يا رب العالمين اللهم إنا مغلوبون فانصرنا اللهم إنا مغلوبون فانصرنا اللهم إنا مغلوبون فانصرنا وآخر العوان الحمد لله رب العالمين وآخر الصلاة إن صلاة فتنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعدكم لعلكم تذكرون